Buenas tardes, simpatistas. Eh, mi nombre es Yehuda Pabshalom, que es imposible acordarse de un nombre así, pero nací en la Argentina con, como Javier Roberto Bogoslavski. Nací en Argentina, nadie es perfecto. Y, y Argentina no está perfecto últimamente. Eh, es lo que estamos, eh, pero desde los 10 años estoy en Israel, la mayoría de mi vida. Y estoy muy orgulloso y contento de ustedes de que hacen estos eventos y que esta es una oportunidad de encontrarse otra vez como grupo. Agradezco a Sur y a Esther que tanto labor de amor en hacer este evento y entiendo que el aprendizaje para ustedes fue muy profundo en Impado, que es una de las instituciones más importantes de Latinoamérica. Y eh, lo que en la Universidad de Braica, ¿quiénes somos? Somos la, la voz académica de la comunidad judía para toda Latinoamérica. Y eh, tenemos algunos eh, temas eh, muy profundos que son lo judaico, estudio de hebreo, área judaica. Pero también tenemos todo este vínculo con Israel, que es un gran país emprendedor. Y nosotros como israelíes nos gusta quejar mucho de nuestro país, que eso es lo que podés hacer en una democracia, como en México e Israel. Yo sé que ustedes también se quejan mucho de su país, pero de hecho sí reconozco y reconocemos que Israel es un país emprendedor y nosotros queremos regalar lo que sabemos hacer y el pensamiento estratégico al resto del mundo. En la universidad es para nosotros un espacio de diálogo con todo, con todo Latinoamérica, pero especialmente acá con México, para ver qué de las ideas israelíes se pueden tropicalizar. Y nada más quería decir algo sobre el pueblo judío, de que yo no creo que haya algo genético especial que hace al pueblo judío un pueblo emprendedor y a Israel que es un país judío. Lo que pasó en Europa es que cuando Toda la, la sabiduría la tenía lo, la familia real y los curas. El pueblo no, no sabía nada. Y en el judaísmo hay como un, eh, hay una obligación de enseñar a leer y a pensar desde los tres años. Y así tenías generaciones y generaciones de gente pensante que cuando se creó el Estado de Israel ya es una generación después de otra generación que valora mucho la educación. Israel tiene el número tres en el mundo de la gente educada. Entonces algo que es obvio, y en este país hay tanta gente inteligente e emprendedora, lo más que demos educación alta, educación superior a la gente, eso es para el emprendedurismo, trabaja muy bien. Otra cosa que tiene Israel, hay una investigación que es en un libro que algunos de ustedes leyeron, Startup Nation, que tiene que ver con el ejército. En el ejército israelí hay unidades muy inteligentes que la jerarquía no es así, es un poco más flat. Y un soldado le puede decir al comandante, lo que estás haciendo, hay acá un error y el comandante escucharía, muchos de mis amigos que se pusieron emprendedores como Yair, salieron de la Fuerza Aérea. Y en la Fuerza Aérea, cuando casi hay un accidente, hacen toda una investigación. Y algo que en Israel permitimos es aprender de errores. Sé que en México, todavía en la cultura mexicana, hay mucho miedo de admitir hice un error. Y en los mejores espacios emprendedores de Israel, está bien hacer errores y decir Casi hubo un error y cómo eh, corregimos esto. Y hay otra cosa en Israel, ustedes también son un país abierto a la inmigración, pero Israel son todos inmigrantes. Y cuando sos inmigrante tomas chances porque no tienes nada que perder. Entonces, como hay tanto cultura de inmigrantes en Israel, eh, la gente eh, tocó muchos chances. Israel, ustedes saben, viene el USB, el stick de Israel, viene el Waze. Eh, eh, muchos, muchos inve, inve, ¿cómo se dice? Invenciones. Inventos. Inventos salen de, de Israel. Y mucho tiene que ver con ese pensamiento emprendedor. 
Y el último ejemplo que les quiero dar, antes de que Yair va a, a darnos su visión de estrategia, es que cuando yo era representante en Israel en Estados Unidos, estuve en Tulsa, Oklahoma, no es Nueva York, pero era interesante, había ahí una base de fuerza aérea. Y llegó un amigo mío, que era comandante de la fuerza aérea israelí, e hicieron como una guerra de juegos, que, pero en el aire real, pero tocas, es como sacaste el avión con el laser, ¿no? Después de 20 minutos, pararon el ejercicio, porque todo, todo, los israelíes estaban todavía volando y todos los estadounidenses ya, ya se cayeron. Y no entendieron qué, qué tiene el israelí, que es un, el mejor piloto del mundo, y, y de veras que son. Y descubrieron de que el israelí lee el manual del F-15 o el F-16, lo tira, y empieza a buscar otras opciones que no están escritas en el manual. Y creo que si hay algo que, que te muestra la diferencia entre el pensamiento israelí, que es muy romper la the box, thinking out of the box, y el, America, el, el estadounidense que iba por el manual, y, y es un poco cuadrado, entonces los israelíes me dijo, pararon el ejercicio porque era demasiado. Los mexicanos somos mejores porque ni leemos el manual. <risa> y entonces no necesita fuerza aérea. <risa> no, pero ya sé que tienen... Por eso no tenemos aviones. Sé que tienen un buen ejército y una buena fuerza aérea y algunos israelíes llegan acá a asesorar y ayudar. Entonces, le, les agradezco y también a Norma de mi universidad que ella eh, identificó qué tanto podemos ofrecer regalos como Yair Saco que está con nosotros hoy. Que él trabajó conmigo en la Universidad de ONU Ahora yo estoy aquí en la Universidad de Braica, él está en la Universidad de Tel Aviv. Y yo lo, yo lo introduzco, ¿ustedes? Eh, tú, no, usted, yo, ustedes. Tú, tú. Ok. Eh, Yair eh, hizo algo muy especial en la Universidad de Tel Aviv. Hay ahí en la universidad, que es, creo que es la más grande de Israel, y yo, yo soy graduado de la Universidad de Tel Aviv y estoy muy orgulloso de esa universidad. La idea de traer Yair, que él creció en business, él creció en ingeniería, en startups, estuvo 10 años en California, en Inter. Traer una persona así a abrir, a abrir un centro de emprendedurismo es justo el pensamiento israelí, cómo lo incorporamos a la educación. Y lo que escuché de él es muy emocionante, porque todos los estudiantes, no importa si sos de filosofía, historia o ingeniería, tienen que tomar, pueden elegir tomar esta unidad del centro del emprendedurismo o emprendedurismo y eh, estoy tan contento y emocionado de tener a Yair acá a compartir parte de lo que sabe hacer. Entonces, como Universidad de Braica, los invitamos a estar en contacto con nosotros para hacer eventos que tengan que ver con el emprendedurismo judío e israelí y su tropicalización a otros contextos en el mundo. Entonces, eh, puedo invitar a Yair. Come over here. I said some things, nice things about you, and now it's your face. Come on. Entonces, nos agradezco mucho. Okay, good afternoon. Wow, <clears throat> what a welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very, very glad to be here. I want to thank uh, University of Ibraica for uh, uh, inviting me from Norma for setting this up and of course for you making, making the time to listen to me. Um, <clears throat> this is a very bad time to start a presentation after lunch. So I just want to one, ask one question. If I see you fall asleep, should I wake you up or let you sleep? <laughs> okay. So um, let me start. So I'm going to walk around. I'm not going to be on the stage all the time. But I thought I would start with a you know, brief introduction of who I am. So like it was said, my name is Yair Sako. Um, I spent about 25 years in the high tech industry. Uh, I'm a graduate of Technion. It's a technical uh, uh, 
academia. I studied engineering and uh, computer science. Uh, I took my MBA in the USA. I uh, then spent about 10 years working in uh, the Bay Area near San Francisco. I spent five years with Intel. And actually, what you're going to see today is my story of what I've been through when I was in Intel. Uh, after Intel, I, I spent another five years with a very large American company, also in, in the US. I moved back to Israel in 1998. I uh, started a venture capital firm. I raised uh, $120 million and invested in startups. Did it for about seven years and then uh, went back to management. I uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, set up a company in China. I managed a company in the US for a while. And about five years ago, I decided to move to the nonprofit social uh, venture market. Um, and I joined a few uh, initiatives in that space. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but today I'm on the board of uh, four uh, social businesses. Two are dealing with uh, youth at risk, and two are dealing with uh, um, what we call shared society, the relationship between Jews and Arabs uh, in Israel. And about a year ago, I joined the Tel Aviv University to set up a new entrepreneurship center. And as uh, Hilda said, uh, it's a very unique center. It's a, it's a cross campus. To those of you who don't know Tel Aviv, it's the largest university in Israel. 50% uh, of all entrepreneurs in Israel came from Tel Aviv University. And we're now trying to teach entrepreneurship to everyone, all our students. So this is about me. And now let's talk about uh, what we're doing here today. So, the main uh, uh, theme of the presentation today is really talk about strategy, and to show that strategy is not just a simple factor, it's not something just a straight line, but it has many, many facets, many angles that we have to look at. And I want to show you this story using, uh, show you this thing using the intro story, and since I'm getting to work, if you don't mind, I'm going to take off my jacket. So I'm very actually not going to talk about uh, strategy. Uh, what I want to point out is really the strategy is a holistic way of looking at the world. It has many facets. And I'm going to show you the way Intel took advantage of strategy to become the world leader. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Intel has about 80% market share of the key component in every computer that we're buying. And it held that market share for over 30 years, till today. So it's pretty amazing how it was able to do so. Uh, in terms of the presentation structure, I'm going to start with a brief uh, tutorial, talk about you know, the motivation uh, of why it is doing what it's doing, and then I'm going to dive into the actual strategy and what they've done over the years. Uh, very important to note, all the slides that are in blue are original slides from Intel from the early 90s. These are the slides that were presented in our executive management meetings, in our work meetings, uh, I actually saved all the presentations. So these are original slides that I used from there. And of course, I'll talk about them. So really, if you like, the main uh, uh, theme of this uh, um, presentation is Intel's desire to become number one. And for Intel, not being number one was not, was not an option. Because for Intel, the window market, it needed to produce in very high volume so it can get to very low cost. And for that, you have to be number one to be able to sell in that, uh, uh, in that type of environment. So, a little bit of uh, history. Uh, Intel was founded in uh, 1968 by these three uh, beautiful gentlemen. Uh, Robert Noyce, sorry, um, uh, wow, I forget his name, anyway. Uh, this is Robert Noyce, this is Andy Grove, and I'll remember. Uh, Moore, thank you, Gordon Moore, thank you very much. We got a shining student here. Um, actually, uh, uh, Gordon and uh, uh, Moore, and uh, I keep losing his name. Moore? Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. So, so Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce actually came out first, and then Andy joined a few months later, and Andy really became the legendary CEO of the company. And in 1971, they invented something called a CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. And the big invention back then was the fact that they invented a chip that it's a 
if you like, it's like a brain. Before then, all the chips that were invented, that were produced, were able to do one thing. So you would say, okay, I will, if I'm looking at the, these little pins here, I would put a, a voltage here, zero here, one here, zero here, and the other side I would get a certain, a certain uh, uh, result. And it was fixed. The 4004 was very programmable. I could tell them, look, if you see 101, then, but this one is uh, zero, do one thing. This one is one, do other thing. So it's actually like a little brain that you can program it. This was the first time that they invented a programmable chip. And very quickly, of course, it became a very big success. Now, this unit, the CPU, is actually the heart of every PC. If you look at the PC, the PC is composed of a motherboard. This is a motherboard. I'm sure you've seen one of these before. And on the motherboard, there's a, there's a lot of real estate. This, these, are, uh, these are memory chips. These are uh, uh, sockets where you put cards in there. And of course, this is a CPU. And um, well, over the years, the CPU became the most important part of the motherboard. 25% of the cost of the motherboard was actually the CPU. So just think about it. Every motherboard was sold. Intel took 25% of that into their pocket. Okay, it's a huge part, and of course, contributed a lot to the Intel, uh, um, to the Intel success. Now, just kind of to help you a little bit, I have here a, I need mean, this. Oh, oh, you know, oh, that's much better. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. This is much better. So what I brought you me some examples, some samples. What I'm going to hand out for you right now is actually the actual Pentium processor that was manufactured about 30 years ago. Uh, you can look at it, but please be careful. You're not that many in the world like this. Okay, so it's more of a museum exhibit. What you see on the back side, of course, is the main. On the front side, on the front side, you actually see the real chip. This is the, the glary stuff, is the actual silicon. Of course, in a real environment, it's going to be covered with, uh, with something. But this gives you the, the notion of what a CPU looked like back in 1993. So I'll stop passing it here, OK? Sure. Also, kind of just to give you a notion of if you all remember way back when you were, you know, all PCs had a card, cards that were getting in them. So here's this example of what a card looked like. You can also pass it along to the people here. <coughs> So, <laughs> things are moving very quickly. Uh, after the 404, what we're seeing here is kind of the history of the computer industry. Uh, the 404, actually, let's go backwards. In 1955, Intel came up with the first commercial uh, uh, computer. Um, and as I said, in 1971 was the first CPU, 404. After that, you know, in 75, uh, Microsoft uh, was founded. Uh, Apple II, which was the most successful PC back then, uh, came out in 1977. 1981, Intel invents the 8088. This is a much more developed version of the CPU, much more powerful than the 4004. But the real breakthrough uh, comes in 1985, when Intel invents the 386. And I'm sure all, all of you are young enough to remember the 386. Uh, it made a major difference because for the first time you can buy a PC and you can actually do some business work with it. So back in the old days there was there were, uh, uh, software like uh, EasyCalc and Lotus 1, 2, 3 and all kinds of uh, software that allows you, you know, Lotus 1, 2, 3 is like the father or the grandfather of Excel of today. And it became, made the PC very popular. But still back in those days, PCs were considered as toys. They're not that powerful. Another major breakthrough uh, came, in, uh, came in 1989 when Intel announced the 486. And in 1993, Intel announced the Pentium processor, which has a major leap in performance. It was the first time that Intel came up with a CPU that was able to compete with the big guys. The big guys back then were Sun Microsystems and HP and digital equipment, and some companies don't exist anymore uh, today. So just to make clear, clear what is a CPU, to those of you who look at ads like this, buy a computer, 
then this is today, this is what CPUs are, are called. I7, actually I7 is probably the highest level CPU of Intel today. Okay, so let's do the tutorial, let's move on. <coughs> Intel's mission in 1990, around the 1990s, uh, was to be, to do a great job to our customers, employees, and stakeholders by being the preeminent building block, the preeminent building block supplier to the computer industry. Meaning we want to provide the building block to create the computer industry and make it stronger and better. By the way, with time, close to the end of the 90s, they, they made it the computer and communication industry because communication became so strong. So, to do so, one of the main tools or capabilities that Intel had was their FAB. So FAB is basically a place where you manufacture CPUs or manufacture components overall. Uh, one of the key problems with FABs, they're extremely expensive. Why they're expensive? You can see if you look at the CPU. CPUs have very small threads in them. It's like wires that they, they conduct electricity. And even a small piece of uh, dust can destroy a CPU. So for you to actually be able to manufacture CPUs, you have to manufacture them in what is called clean rooms. And you have uh, uh, air conditioning systems and air cleaning systems that clean the air all the time. Just to give you a, a bit of a notion, um, back in the painting days, uh, I think we were looking at uh, uh, CPUs that test these wires in, in the thickness of uh, a micron of a millimeter. Today we're talking of uh, 0.12 nanometer. So it's like a millionth of a millionth uh, 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 of, a, of, a, of a meter. So you know it's way thinner than even a hair. So every little bit of dust can destroy a whole set of production. To build these factories, it costs a huge amount of money. And not only it costs a huge amount of money, but every time you produce a new generation of CPUs, like you move from 3D6 to 4D6, it's a different technology. I will show you later some examples that you'll be able to see the technology. But every time you move from 286 to 386 to 486, you need to produce a whole, new, a whole new factory. Not only that, many times it takes about three years to, produce, to, to build a factory. And many times, when you build a factory, you don't even know what you're going to produce in it. Okay, so you take a major risk and a major bet. When I say a lot of uh, a lot of money to build these factories, we're talking about you know to build the factories to make the the, the Pentium. It cost about five billion dollars. In today's money, it's ten billion dollars. It still doesn't sound a lot in today's money, but just realize back then, Intel market capitaliz capitalization was five billion dollars. So they build a factory in the same size of their entire market capitalization. Okay, just to so understand the extent of the investment and the risk that they're taking. Um, so what do you do? If you have such a huge risk and it costs such a lot of money, what do you need to do? You need to make sure this factory is producing full production at all times. So you all savvy business people, I don't have to explain this too much to you. I typically show this uh, uh, in MBA classes. I'm just trying to explain the importance of uh, producing in, in uh, full capacity. Let's say you, you build a factory, it costs a billion dollars, and let's say that uh, um, in full capacity you can manufacture 10 million units a year, okay? This is the only math slide I'm gonna have. Uh, factory use for life, let's say ten, it's 10 years. That means that your depreciation is a million dollars a year, right? 100 million dollars a year, sorry, 100 million dollars a year. So, if I'm, produce, if I'm producing 10 million units, the allocation of the depreciation, cost allocation per component is $10. If I'm producing just 400,000 units, the cost allocation is $250. Okay? Yes. So clearly, I want to produce in full production. Now, remember, Intel's mission is to be number one. To be number one, I have to get to low cost because I want to conquer the market. So I need to produce in full production at all time. That's a new challenge. Okay? So. In order to do so, Intel actually had to control the market in both ends. On one hand, ah, sorry, I just wanted to show you first some of the cost numbers to figure out, we kind of talked about that. But to uh, build the capacity for the 386, it cost $100 million. 
to build the capacity the 486 cost one billion dollars, and to build the capacity for the 386 for the Pentium it costs five billion dollars. Now the risk was huge, and Intel did not make this. So we started building the factory for the uh, the Pentium in 1989, with the intention of launching the yes. And you said like people from the 80s, and you had competition with HP and some other mm -hmm. some other players. But now, for a long time, you've been like, you, you have like 80% or Intel has 80% of the market. So how did the Intel went gain all that market went? It's an excellent question. I want to talk all about that. A few more slides. Okay. Um, just, to, just to understand the, the, the level of risk here. In 1989, Intel started investing $5 billion, the exact level of their uh, market cap, in building a new factory with the intention of producing the Pentium three years later. We were going to announce the Pentium in July of 1992, three years later, okay? We couldn't make it, CPU didn't work. So we pushed the announcement to November of 1998, 1992, still the CPU didn't work. We pushed the announcement to March of 1993, still CPU didn't work. Eventually we started production in May of 93, so about a year later. You can imagine what the cost impact is for such a delay. So the bets are huge. So for you to do that, it needs, it needs to control, to be successful in actually managing that, it needs to control the bo both ends of the market. What do I mean by, by both ends? First of all, it must ensure that factories produce at full capacity at all time. This is the only way to get to very low cost. If I get to very low cost, I can get to more markets. Because if my cost is high, less people will buy it. So I have to make sure I'm producing at low cost all the time. But if I'm producing the full production all the time, I need someone to buy that. So I need to generate demand. So I need to control both the supply side and the demand side. I need to make sure that all the time people are buying my components. Because if, you don't, if they don't buy my components, I'm going to get stuck with inventories. So how do I do that? How do I, how do I control both the fact that I produce it full and make sure that my inventory is all being bought. This is really the key to understanding the Intel way of thinking. Okay? And the strategy, the strategy, I don't, it was actually the previous slide anyway. But the strategy was always build and fill. Build a factory and fill it to full capacity immediately. And for that, you need to control both ends. And this is why Intel uh, was so intent on being number one, so they can sell everything that they manufacture. Let's say a few words about uh, how the, the PC market uh, is, uh, is structured. So as you know, PCs or today laptops are being bought by the home users and business users. Also, uh, they are being sold by, by, by what we call PC OEMs. These are the guys that should buy the chips from Intel and compose the, the computers around them. So really the end users, when they buy a PC, they buy a PC from one of these guys. Mm -hmm. And they also buy software from all kinds of software companies, you know, uh, Adobe and Microsoft and so forth. What users don't know that today, less, maybe back then a little bit better, more, that behind this little thing, there are many more components. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, there is a CPU that comes from Intel or AMD or other companies. There is all kinds of like memory components and uh, the boards that I've uh, uh, shown you here. Um, so all these components are in the PC. Typically, users don't know what's in the PC. It's the same way that when you buy a car, you don't really know who makes the engine. So Mercedes-Benz is a world-renowned manufacturer of engines. They actually manufacture engines for airplanes. But does anyone here know who manufactures the engine for the A180 that you're seeing in the picture? We know. Okay, Renault. Renault is manufacturing the engine for that. And I can give you some more examples, like uh, uh, Alfa Romeo actually uh, manufactures their uh, engine in, with uh, Ferrari. The good reason to buy Alfa Romeo. Okay. Uh, Toyota, with some of the motors, are using actually engines from Subaru. So we really don't know what's under the hood. Okay. The same way, you know, if you buy uh, cheese, do you know who's the milk producer? We don't. Okay. So, <laughs> so to control both ends of this 
both the supply and the demand, Intel took a very innovative approach. Intel went straight to the end user. And this, in 18, no other component vendor actually went to the end user and tried to influence them on how to buy uh, uh, computers. For Intel to control the market, they needed to control the end users so they can create massive demand, so they can put their factories to produce at all times. But if you have massive demand, and if your factories are producing at full, uh, at full capacity, you really can't control the market demand. So that's actually what Intel did. Intel created over demand. Okay? So if you have over, over, if you have over demand, everything that you're manufacturing is being sold. But if you have over demand, that invites competition. Because all of a sudden, there is a shortage. So everyone is trying to come in and you know, eat your cake also. Intel said, no, we're not going to let competition come in. We're going around so fast that no one can really catch us. So every time they came up with a, a new CPU, a year and a half later, they came up with another version. Now, for the competition to copy, let's say, the 486, they first have to wait until the 486 is introduced. And then they take the chip, and they do reverse engineering. And they manufacture it. It takes about a year. By the time they manufacture 486, Intel is doing Pentium. So the whole idea was, we need to run faster than the competition. So because of the competition, because of controlling them, the strategy was really to run faster and not run much faster than the competition. At the same time, we need to control PC manufacturers because it's not enough that we manufacture the CPUs. We need to make sure that the Dell and Compaq and IBM buy this from us and are able to very quickly turn around and create new PCs based on our new, our new uh, uh, CPUs. Um, we looked at the motherboard at the very beginning of the presentation. To design a new motherboard back in those days took about six to nine months. So every time Intel came out with a new CPU, a, uh, a PC provider needed to actually redesign their motherboard. Many times totally from the scratch because new CPU means new memory chips, new other components, all the real estate on the motherboard is changing. So how do I make now it's a huge investment. Typically what OEMs would like to do, PC OEMs, what would like to do, they want to uh, design one motherboard and sell a lot of it so they can depreciate the design cost of that. But Intel came in and changed it every time they change the CPU. So how do you still make them, the, the, the PC OEM change quickly? So really Intel had to control all of these people, the end users, the competitors, and the customers. And now I'm going to get to the fun part because I'm going to show you how Intel did that. Okay, what was Intel's strategy starting back in 1985 and all the way to the mid-90s? The strategy that brought Intel to the point where for the last 30 years, Intel has 80% of the CPU market. So these are the key strategies. First of all, back in 85, I'll talk about it in the next few slides, but the market was really based on the big computers. There were no people, there were very few or not PCs at all. It was all big IBMs, and uh, digital equipment, and big HP computers, and CDC, and Boros, and companies that don't exist anymore that created computers that are, you know, half the size of this room, okay? So first strategy was to drive the PC, drive the market to the PCs. Second strategy, be the dominant player in this market, create the land, and also we'll talk about Intel's venture capital strategy in these lines. So let's see what Intel did in the business market. As I said, back in those days, this is the 80s, the market is dominated by a big company called IBM, and the system is called IBM System 390. It's about the size of the doors over there, okay? Huge system, uh, all the smarts is here, and you buy uh, terminals to connect to them. Another very successful company was Sun, Sun Workstation. Just kind of to give you a, a you know, feeling in today's money, a Sun Workstation would cost about $100,000, an IBM computer around half a million, $700,000. That was the cost back then for these things. And it was HP competing with Sun also making big workstations. These are some examples of the companies that are working there. What was the problem with this? What was Intel talking about? The problem with this is that they were all what is called vertical uh, uh, integration. So if you bought a computer for Digital, Digital Equipment Corporation, 
you have to, the CPU was from DEC, the computer came from DEC, the operating system, you know, today we have Windows and iOS, it was a DEC operating system, all the application came from DEC, and also the distribution were a channel that was owned by DEC. You could not develop a program for DEC and have it run on, I, on an IBM computer. You cannot develop a, a program on IBM computer and have it run on a Boros or CDC computer. That resulted in very expensive industry. Not only that the computers were very, 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 very expensive, because you know, each of these guys, manufacturers, you know, 200, 500 CPUs a year, maybe 1,000 CPUs a year, uh, sold maybe 1,000 computers a year. Market was very small. If market is small, you can take the prices up. Software was expensive, distribution was expensive, everything was expensive. IBM, just to give you an example, back in 85, had the highest market cap in the world. IBM back then, her market cap was $95.6 billion. It seems very low today, but you know, think in terms of you know, Google today, $780 billion. And IBM with $96.5 billion uh, was twice as big as the next competitor. Okay, so the next competitor was around $50 billion. So a huge company. And in the face of this huge company, comes this uh, CEO from a small, and back then, 85, 87, $2 billion market cap company, a cheap company, a cheap head and nothing. And he basically said, look, all you guys there, IBM, digital equipment, CDC, if you don't change, you're gonna lose the market. We are in the face of transition. The market is moving from the vertical computer industry to the horizontal computer industry. And the horizontal computer industry is gonna look like this. There's gonna be one CPU provider, and it's going to be low cost, cheap, and it's going to dominate the market. And you know, you may have also some, Motor Motorola 68K was the, the CPU for Apple, okay? So this is the most, the market is a little bit of Apple and some others. And computers are going to come from all kinds of uh, companies, IBM and Compaq and Dell and whatever you, and HP. And operating system, you know, back then it was still DOS, to those of you who remember, DOS, Windows and others. And applications are going to come from multiple vendors because everything is going to be standard. So the industry is going to move from a vertical industry to a, uh, a horizontal industry. This was a very brave move by Andy. Okay, Andy Grove was back, back then the CEO of the company. Surprisingly, this is what happened. 1992, Business Week magazine front page deconstructed the computer industry. Basically, it talks about the fact that the entire computer industry is basically exploding and it's totally deconstructing because of this move led by Intel to commoditize computing power and bring it to a level that everyone can, be, can, 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 uh, uh, can buy it. It was really done by two things, A, by manufacturing of Intel, but also by a lot of marketing activity of Andy, of Andy and the executive staff at Intel. Look what happened to IBM. 85, almost a hundred billion dollar market cap, one of the top 10 market cap companies in the world, and now looking there, in 91, it disappears from the top 10 companies because the market is deconstructing. And what's dominating now are PCs. And every business person and every company are not talking anymore about huge computer, computers. They're talking about we need to buy PCs. We need to understand how this PC market works. It's a major revolution. So that's the business market. At some point, Inter realizes that the business market, you people, are conservative and you're too slow to move. And you don't move fast enough to PCs because Andy is trying to sell more PCs. And the business market is slow. Why do the business market is slow? Remember, <coughs> to buy a computer back then was a half a million dollar decision. In every corporation, half a million dollar decision, it's a committee. It's a committee, it takes six months to make a decision. And then someone appeals it, it takes another six months to make a decision, okay? PCs are back then about $10,000, still very expensive, but they went through the same process in all corporations. And it was just too damn slow for us at Intel. And then we came to the conclusion, well, you know, we need to turn on the, the home market. There's an opportunity there. If we can really get to the low cost we're trying to get, you know, sell PCs at $1,000, which was this unbelievable number back then, we can turn on the, the home market. So how do we turn on the home market? First of all, we have to educate consumers. As I, as I showed you earlier, we have to go straight to consumer and go, look, buy PCs, but not only buy PCs. 
by this piece that has the internal side of Back in uh, uh, 1981, I think, it was 1889, I think it was, let me see the exact year. Start this campaign in 1991 with a major investment. It invested $150 million in one year. So $150 million in 1991, it's about $300 million in today's money. But see, it has to be all proportional. So I would say it's more like spending a million dollars today in one year on advertising. Okay, it got to the point that uh, over the year, there were over 3,000 pages with the internal logo on it in the US only. 3,000 pages in one year is about 10 pages per year. So that you would see this logo. And you just start talking to the consumers and saying, look, you need to buy PCs, and how do you pick the best PC? It has to have Intel inside. Intel start, uh, strikes a deal with all their uh, OEM, OEMs. And basically this deal says, look, if you advertise your PCs, and you put the logo, the Intel inside logo on your ads, we're going to give you a payback. We're going to give you cash back. The result is that Intel not only giving them cash back because Intel inside is in there, Intel actually is able to negotiate with all the publishers in the US a discounted deal for everyone who publishes an ad with the Intel logo on it. So it reduces the price. And the result, of course, is just unbelievable amount of advertising from Intel inside between 1991, 1996, the market is flooded with Intel inside uh, ads, moving the whole market. And then, Intel takes another step. This is like a white label model, white label, you know? You, you get that one uh, uh, agreement to come by the screen. It's not, it's, it's not a white label model. I mean, uh, uh, this is, for example, an ad from, uh, from, from Gateway or from Micro. So this is actually, this is Dell. So Dell actually manufactured the PCs. It was all Dell making. They got the CPU from Intel. The only thing is that Intel said, look, when you advertise your PC, put the Intel inside logo on it, and put the Intel inside logo on your computer also. OK? And if you use, I'm sorry? It is more than one level agreement. It's not a white level because, it it, it, no, it, it's not, because the brand is Dell. Intel does manufacture the PCs. We use, we use the, the, the Intel. Where is the CPU? I'm going to get it back. Because I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 manufactures only this. It doesn't manufacture the PC. Just this. If you want to have the Intel inside logo, you, need to you, have, to, you have to buy this from Intel, and you have to put the Intel inside logo on your computer. But it's like, you know, I, I, I showed earlier the, the, the Rolls-Royce A180. Okay? It's like, you know, would say to Rolls-Royce, when you sell me 180, put my logo, little logo, below on the hood. Okay? So, okay, I'll, you can guide here. You can take a look at this here. Sure. I'm, I'm running very fast, actually, so if you have any more questions, you know, stop me as you, uh, as you like. Please. What was your, your role in you know, which area were you participating? So, I was the, the senior product line manager for the banking processor. So, I actually managed this product line. Senior, senior product, line, product line manager for the painting processor. Uh, in No, in the US. I, I said I, I worked 10 years in the US, five of which was in Intel, and throughout the time I was with the painting group. Yeah, thank you, good question. <laughs> so in 1992, Intel actually steps up the marketing, and for the first time, for a cheap company, Intel comes up. Want to all your software fans? Then look for the Intel Inside symbol on your next computer. 
it says you've got a real power source on the inside. Like the upgradable Intel 486 microprocessor. Power it up and run your software. At light speed. Intel, the computer inside. This was the first ever TV ad for a component. This was the first ever TV ad for Intel. Of course, later on, more ads. But uh, just to make this ad, Intel actually hired uh, George Lucas, the guy who, was the, who did the uh, Star Wars, to make this ad for Intel. Uh, Intel did more than that. We actually, uh, back in those days, trying to get people to, you know, if you didn't see the ad, at least maybe the music will uh, be in your, in your uh, ears. So we did what is called the mnemonic. <laughs> Like a Pavlovian reaction when you hear this noise, ah, Intel. Okay, so it's a brilliant move by Intel marketing to come up with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, mnemonics. So we talked so far on two things. We looked at how Intel drove the market from the mainframes to PCs. We talked about Intel uh, taking major moves to drive the whole PC market. Now let's talk about what else is happening in the market. How Intel became a dominant player. Basically, how Intel crushed all the competitors in the market. Because if this market is so successful, and CPUs are selling in the millions per year, how do you make the competition go away? And back in those days, there was a lot of competition. 1992, of course, with AMD, and AMD said, well, you know, we have 286, 386, 486, next one is 586. So they came out with a 586. There was a company called Cyrex, also came out with a 586. These are all components that are exact, identical copies of the Intel Pentium. Of course, they made some changes, so they won't uh, uh, be sued by Intel. Uh, National Semiconductor came with a chip, also 586. Texas Instruments. Uh, digital equipment company doesn't exist anymore, but back then they came up with a chip called Alpha, and Alpha was a different architecture. So remember, they actually still had this this uh, mindset of vertical because if you have a different CPU, this means all the software is different, operating system, application, and so forth. Um, Apple and IBM actually worked together with Motorola. Sorry, Apple worked together with IBM and Motorola that produced a chip called PowerPC. This was actually the CPU of all the Apples for many, many years. Today, by the way, Apple also uses uh, uh, Intel, and now it's moving to Android. But for many years, it also uh, eventually gave up and moved to the Intel architecture. So a lot of competitors here. And the key question is, what do you do to deter competition? How do you fight these competitors? Yes, questions, please. What? You keep on coming with new processors every time, no? That's a way of... So, excellent. One of the, one of the key ways of competing with, with uh, uh, the competition is coming up with new processors. But Intel perfected that into a real strategy. This slide is about 30 years old. And basically, it shows the Intel strategy. It, it, in one sentence, eat your own children. <laughs> Intel was very serious. And look. We made the 26, and then we create the 36. It's going to eat the 26, but we're going to get a bigger market. And then we're going to have the 46. It's going to eat the 36, and it's going to have a much bigger market. And the Pentium is going to do this 46. And the P6, which was a code name, we didn't have the next case, please. How do you know you will have the, the new technology? How do you know mm -hmm. from the 486 you will have the Pentium? It's a new invention. How do you work so sure, sure that <laughs> it will, you will get there? Because now it's I7, called, I think it's the end. No, no, no. It's good. They announced a new one. They also announced a new no, one. No, but it's the same. It's, there's no so so much difference like to except for in the So I don't know. I'm not so much in that business anymore. But you asked a good question. How do you know that you're going to have a market? Oh, sorry. <coughs> So first of all, you don't. You take a calculated risk. And you know, if you invented the first CPU in the 1971 or 77, the way it was, and you do this consequently, so, so you have you, you have an aesthetic what CPUs are, you know how they're manufactured, and of course you're taking a risk. 
even at every point in time, I don't have anything to draw here, but uh, um, think of a staggered uh, uh, um, development teams. So actually, should do that. So we have one team working on the 486, and in parallel, in the middle of that period, there's a team starting to work on the Pentium. When this thing is done, they start working on the next CPU. Okay? So at every point in time in Intel, there are at least two, sometimes even three. Now, each of these design teams, it's about 300 people. Okay? So Intel basically has two teams of 300 people working in, in staggered fashion every time on the next CPU. And it's a bet. It's absolutely a bet. That's what, when I said earlier about building a fab for the Pentium for $5 billion, the fab was supposed to get in production in July of 1992. And it went in production in May of 93, the whole year. It's a huge loss. Okay? Because the bet, sometimes you don't make the bet. Okay? But it shows you, one second, it shows you the boldness of Intel to take such bold steps with the notion and the, and the conviction to be the market leader. Okay? Yes, please. But I guess it's not only the problem of, of uh, being uh, like super fast in creating new processors. Uh, I guess that there's a point that uh, Microsoft and, and new softwares are requiring more uh, speed and, and power from the processors. So you, you, could, you could drive a car and then still make it 10% more efficient than just 10%. But how do you go from a 386 to a Pentium and then to a Pentium 7? Because it requires so much more power. So first of all, you have a lot of smart people and you need, you need a lot of innovation. And you know, Intel, Intel, Intel had a huge uh, research team that basically researched what to do next. And the big difference between the 486 and Pentium was the invention of what is called the floating point unit. So actually, if you look at the chip, you can actually see that it has like two parts in it. One part is a traditional 386, 486, if you like. And another part was a completely new CPU just for mathematics. <coughs> because they felt that this is where it needs to have power. The next generation, so the first painting was with the floating point. The, not the, the generation after that, or one after, uh, we also devised a special part in the, in the CPU uh, for uh, video manipulation, for graphics, because we realized games are becoming straight. So always we look at what the market is doing, and when it's progressing the CPUs in that way, okay? And clearly you take that, but look, if you're doing CPUs for so many years, you know what you're doing. You know, the, the, the jump from 46 to Pentium was a huge bet. The jump from Pentium to the i3, i5 was a major bet. But still, in two years, the major bets are becoming smaller because you really know what you're doing. Okay, it's not that big. Okay? But I want to show you, in terms of Intel's conviction and the boldness of the moves, I want to show you something which is pretty amazing. So this is the market production, not market share. Okay, market production. In the end of 92, end of 92, Intel factories manufacture 50% of what Intel is selling is 386, 50% of what Intel is selling is 486. Okay, this is the end of 92. We're announcing the Pentium in March of 93, it's starting production in May, so we're getting ready for that. But in end of 92, half of what they do is half of the revenue. I think Intel was about 20, Back then, it actually went up very quickly, I don't know, close to $20 billion in sales or something. Maybe 12, or something to do. Anyway, big. Uh, but half of that was 36, half of that was 46. The rest of the market is behind, because as I told you earlier, once Intel introduces the 46, only then competitors can look at the 46 and copy it. And then they start into the factories to produce it. So they're about a year and a half, year and a half behind. So the rest of the competitors are, produ are producing mostly 386, they're the very old technology, and only 10% of the production is, 10, is uh, 486. Okay? Remember this picture. So in March of 93, I'm sitting with uh, Ursula Herrick, she's the head of uh, uh, public relations, and we're meeting with um, uh, uh, Paul Tallini, who was kind of number two at Intel at that time, and we're showing Paul Tallini the first Pentium processor TV end that we're about to launch in March of 93. Okay? Now I'm going to show you two versions of this TV end. I want you to look carefully at these two, on these two uh, uh, heads because I'm going to ask you at the end 
What is the difference between them? Okay? Here we go. This symbol outside says inside you find a legacy of technological leadership. The upgraded Intel 486 processor, power for today's hottest software, and the Intel Pentium processor for the next generation of compatible power. That's Intel, the computer inside. So this is the first ad. Let's look at the second one. Simple outside says inside you'll find a plastic room to work with. The Intel 486 Gate 2 processor. Power for today's parts software. The Intel Pentium processor. For the next generation of compatible power. That's the one that was the difference? So, what was the difference? 386 was not in the picture. Correct. So, in the first ad, I'll go back just to those of you who didn't see that. 46. Why is that happening? So, it's, we're sitting with, uh, with uh, Paul Tellini and I'm showing him the first ad. Look at this 50% of the revenue comes from the 386. And we're showing Paul the first ad, and he's like screaming at us. There is no such CPU! Why are you showing 386? Eliminate that! There is no such CPU! He was just screaming at us. And the reason he did so, he wanted to kill the competition. Why talk about a CPU that we're not going to sell anymore, where all the, comp all the competitors are selling the CPU? We are moving to Pentium. We need to talk about 486 and Pentium. 386 is all technology. Don't show it, don't talk about it. But at the same time, 50% of his sales are 3 to 6. So he's willing to kill 50% of his sales just in order to kill the entire competition. This is how aggressive Intel was in the strategy of fish eating fish. OK? It was a major lesson. Uh, <laughs> But it's not that simple. Why is it not that simple? <laughs> because I told you earlier, for PC manufacturers, this was hell. Why this was hell? Because I get the 486, I take about 100 engineers, and I produce a motherboard. I want to sell thousands of that motherboard because I want to take, you know, I want to depreciate my R&D cost over these components. So I want to send as many 486 as I can. And here comes this little company called Intel, and they're moving the market to Pentium. They're putting Pentium ads. I don't want to move. I don't want to move because I still need to sell more for the 60s. The real question here was, who owns the customer? And this is the battle that we're still seeing today. Okay, if you think of, for example, Apple and Android versus application developers. Where do you go to buy an application? You go to the App Store, or you're going to uh, uh, Play Store. And, and Android uh, uh, Play, Store. Play Store. This is the brand you know. And you buy a piece of software application, most times you don't even know who made the software. So really the owners of the, of the customer are Apple and uh, uh, Android. And the same thing with Amazon. You buy on Amazon. Many times you don't even know the brand of who you're buying. And this is a major uh, uh, war. Uh, there was an article where the CEO of Marriott said, look, my key competitors today are Facebook and Google because they know everything about my customers and they block this information from me. I need to find ways to bypass Google and Facebook and talk directly to customers to understand what they want so I can create a better product for them and they know the brand Marriott and not the brand when they go to Google and do a search and it gives them some kind of hotel, God knows where. And this was the major thing back then. Who owns the customer? IBM and Compaq refused to take the Intel lead. And they said, look, we own the customer. We decide what the customer buy. Intel get out of the market. Stop, them, stop messing with our customers. Compaq, by the way, back then, back in 93, became the world leader in PC manufacturing. It was bigger than IBM. 
every most species sold in the market in the world back then were, were manufactured by Colfax. And Eckhart Pfeiffer was the CEO. He was just furious at Intel. And he said, look, you're not going to dominate the market. We're going to dominate the market. We're going to decide what we're selling. And in Christmas 94, which was really the inflection, inflection point between 50 to 46, Compaq said, no, we're going to sell 46. We're going to sell a $1,000 PC 46 to the market. And I don't care what you tell, but you tell us, we're going to sell 46s. Intel worked with the rest of the market to sell Pentium. Compaq was so adamant that in their 1994 annual report, they showed a picture of their PCs and where the Intel inside logo was typically on the PC, Compaq had another logo. When it says Compaq on the outside, you don't need to worry about what's in the inside. Direct competition to Intel. Okay? Christmas 1994, inflection point between 46 and Pentium. Guess what happened? This was a headline in the magazine, PC Week, one of the leading magazines back then. This is like in March, a few months later. Can you smell that smell? It's the smell of rot of inventory, the smell of rot of fish. In the beginning of 94, you could not buy any warehouse space in all of Texas. All the warehouses were filled with 46s that Compaq could not sell. This was actually changed the position of Compaq in the market. Intel won. Intel won and took the market by storm. So this is Intel and the competition both below and above. Now, we dealt with computers, we dealt with customers, we dealt with competition, we dealt with OEMs. We need to talk about software. How do we drive software to PCs? I have to take you back also, you know, 25 years, but you know, back then, uh, since this whole industry just started, there were a lot of platforms you can develop software. I mean, today, the battle is between Android and Apple. If you develop an application, who do you develop first? I mean, there's still some applications that only work on Android, there's still some applications that only work on, on, uh, on uh, 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 iOS. Back then, part of your, dis your, your purchase decision was based on which application you can get. And back in, you know, 93, 94, if you were a designer, you would buy Apple because all the great Adobe software only work on the Apple uh, platform. If you, had a, uh, you were a computer computer design, you know, making all kinds of uh, uh, chairs or whatever, and the, the exporting software into machines that manufacture that, you would also buy Apple. This is what's where, where these applications were, were held. So Intel had to move the market to PC and you convince uh, uh, software manufacturers, software providers, that the first instantiation of each piece of software they do, they start with PC and then they can move to Apple. Okay? Once again, start the very, the very aggressive marketing campaign with uh, our software uh, developers. Okay, I can't talk about these points, but what have they done? Okay? So, uh, Intel worked with, Intel, first of all, Intel created a complete division of people that all they did were working with software developers to help them develop a better software for Pentium. Intel created a new logo. It says, runs even better on Pentium processor. And if you work with your division and you optimize your software to work on the Pentium, you can get this logo on your uh, box. You know, back then we bought software in boxes, not in downloads. Um, they actually uh, established, uh, they, made, uh, they worked with software providers and to the big ones, they actually allowed them to come to Intel and consult Intel how to design the CPUs better so they have certain functions in the CPU so it make their software run faster, okay? They had a team teams of people that would actually go and sit with <laughs> software manufacturers and um, in their in their uh, uh, R&D rooms and help them develop software and let them, let them optimize it to the Intel CPU because Intel knew best how the CPU work so they can explain this to the software developers. 
and so on and so on and so on. And of course, Intel goes out with a major marketing campaign. So as you can see here, many of these software boxes, you can, it's kind of hard to see, but there's little labels here or in the back. But this is the label that is, if you want to have this label, you have to optimize your software. And if you optimize your software, then of course Intel launches once again a huge marketing campaign around that. that, I kind of talked about a bit earlier, was how do we work with OEMs? So, you know, IBM and Compaq, we already know that they have refused to move faster from 3D6 to 4D6 to Pentium. But there were others, if you like, the second tools. Just to give you the scale, 20% of the sales of Intel back then is to uh, IBM and Compaq. 80% is to a very, very long list of companies that most of them don't exist today. Uh, ALR, AST, Becker and Bell, um, I don't remember all the names, okay? But Intel wants to work with these smaller guys and actually make them move as fast as possible from 3D6 to 4D6 to Pentium because they also believe that if we move the second tiers to Pentium, Compaq and IBM would not have any choice, they also have to move to Pentium. How do we convince them? We devised a complete marketing campaign and basically had all the salespeople of Intel, Intel back then had about about a thousand salespeople around the world. Go and talk to each and every one of these OEMs with a very set of well-defined set of slides to, to convince them that they have to ride the wave if they want to be successful. And the way we want to convince them is by coming up with this statement. Market share is gained and lost during market transitions. So what do I mean by transition? Market transition happens, for example, let's say that I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man, so my life is very simple. I always buy the same jeans, okay? It's always Levi's 504. Now let's say one day Levi's decides to stop manufacturing 504. What do I do? I go 505. So I can go to 505, or I can say, take this opportunity and say, well, maybe I should try and look at other manufacturers of jeans. Maybe they have something interesting. Basically, it's a break in the market. And the same thing here. When you, when you buy 3D6 from Dell all the time, and all of a sudden comes 4D6, you need to reevaluate. It's a different computer, different architecture. Well, maybe I should try other vendors. Maybe they're better. And this is a market transition. So Intel is trying to say to everyone that moving from one technology to the other requires customers to rethink what they're doing. And if they rethink, it's an opportunity for you to come in and grab market share. And this is really where more, most of the market share positions are, are happening. You know, I'm going to give an example. If you look at today, you know, not, no one of us would have considered looking at Tesla. But now that the market is moving to electric cars, all of a sudden Tesla is something that we would like to look at. Although, you know, I for years, you know, buy Mazda. But Mazda doesn't have an electric car. And if, you know, Tesla comes in, I'll probably look at it even though all my life I've always bought Mazda, okay? So we actually devised slides to show OEMs 
the effect of market transition. So this is an original slide. Remember, this is 25 years old, so we talk about some 25 years old technologies. But we said, look, what happened to, how did the Japanese become so successful in cars? Because in the 1970s, there was the oil industry crisis, and Japanese came in with a very small and small cars and uh, um, fuel efficient, and basically took over the American market. It has you know, big cars, heavy uh, gas consumption. Uh, so there was a market transition from big cars, lots of uh, uh, gas consumption, to small economic cars because of the oil uh, market problem. Uh, another transition. Chrysler actually became a world leader because it invented a new class of car. It invented the minivan. And once it invented the minivan, all of a sudden, all these families used to buy a family car. Said, wow, this is a new idea. It's about the same price as a car, but it's a minivan. It's more spacious. And there was a market transition from standard sedans to minivans. And Chrysler led this transition and won huge market share because of that. Another company which is very well known for this still today is HP. You look at the HP, they make a printer. When the printer reaches like the top of their sales, they introduce a new one. Okay? And also there's some old you know, examples here from, what, from Sega and whatever. So we actually went, we showed this slide to and said, look, you gotta own this market position. Okay? And we showed them what happened in the in previous transitions. You know, the leader, the transition of the 286 to the 386 compact was the market leader. And they actually gained, they moved up from having 1.7% market share to 3.8% market share. It seems small, but I'll explain it in a second. Uh, the transition from 386 to 486 was actually dominated by Gatewood, Dell, Packard Bell. Also, each of them increased by two, one, two, or even more uh, market shares. And we told these OEMs, look, this is your opportunity to gain market share. You've got to go and make the transition. Now, it seems small, but this is going to give you an example. Packard Bell uh, uh, went from 6.7%. Oh, what's this? Okay, no, skip that one. Packard Bell, from 93 to 94, gained about four, uh, uh, what is it, four market share points. And actually, their sales went up 100% just because they gained 4% market share. Uh, Gateway went up, in the saw earlier, two market share points, and their sales went up by 40%. So each market share gain for these small manufacturers was huge. And this is how we actually went from one OEM to the other and convinced them, look, there's going to be a market transition from 46 to Pentium. You have to be part of this market transition, and you have to win this. So <clears throat> if you like, this is just the, the kind of the, the final slide of this presentation when we told the OEMs, you have to go and win this market. And interestingly enough, most of them actually decided to do so. And in that, in that period of time, okay. in that period of time, uh, not only did they did so, but Intel actually kind of took ownership. So Paul Tellini, which I mentioned earlier, was number two at Intel, was the mentor of, um, what is it, the CEO of Dell? Mike? Mike Dell. Michael Dell. So, Paul Tillini was actually the mentor of Dell, of uh, Michael Dell. Uh, we had another person, uh, Carl Ebert, who was the, the chief uh, sales uh, officer, and he was mentoring Packard Bell. So we did a lot of things, actually working with them to make sure they make a transition, and through that, sell more CPUs. So, we're talking strategy, we want to take a break, by the way. Yes? Okay. 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 Yeah, she took it. Okay. Ten minutes break. <laughs> 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 Because back then, in 93, 95, I didn't realize what is happening. But you see here an amazing strategy. It's not just a strategy of creating CPUs and dominating the market. But Intel went after every segment, the business segment, the home market, the software developers, the competitors, 
They're OEM manufacturers. Every part of the market income is there, and he's not leaving any stone unturned. So this really makes this strategy a very holistic one. Because they're not just taking one, okay, we're going to be a leading CPU provider, we're going to compete in the CPU. They're taking a full market view and attacking every bit of the market. Before I move on, I kind of heard that there's some questions. So if you have any questions so far, we'd love to take some questions and we can move on to the last two parts are a bit shorter. So any questions so far? Please. I don't know if it's a time to bring up something micro. How did you start to get in the market? I mean, no, no, yeah. how, was, how was the projection? I'm going to read the question. How was the projection of the market gains? I mean, 1983, you got like 40%. So, so the question was how Intel actually gained the market share with time. Exactly, about, about uh, making all these strategies work. So I, I, think, I think the initial 10 years, you know, the 1980s, was actually some of, of a natural uh, development because you know, Intel back in 1977 invented the first CPU. So it was the only provider of CPUs. After they did so, other companies started to manufacture CPUs. National Semiconductors and AMD and others. Um, so this gradually, Intel, uh, you know, was part of this market. I think the big, the big uh, breakthrough came when IBM decided to design the first IBM PC in, uh, I think it was in somewhere in the early 80s, okay, 82, 83. And there was a major competition between Intel and between Motorola. These were two leading CPU providers. And Intel won this battle. And I think what really made Intel a success is the fact that they won the IBM account. And once IBM back then was the leader by far of everything, uh, they actually made Intel the market leader. And Intel actually eventually crushed them out of the market. Okay? But this was really history. I think IBM, the fact that IBM chose Intel, this would make really what made Intel the market leader. Okay? Other questions, please. Nothing? Okay? Go ahead. Yes. We can ask uh, when you Yeah, when just ask, ask, ask as I go, no problem. So, as I said, Intel is tackling every bit of the market, every segment, every facet. What else is there to be done? Well, now that I'm attacking every facet, I want to increase the pie. It's not enough that I own the pie, market share, you know, it's a you know, market share pie. I want to make it a bigger pie. How do I make it a bigger pie? I need to create demand by pushing users, by, to get new users, new people, audiences that did not buy PC before, making them to buy PC. And those who are buying PCs, I want them to start using PCs for new uses. And these new uses are going to use more CPU power, so it will force them to upgrade to a better CPU. And this way, they'll buy a new PC. So Intel actually launches another strategy with the basic idea of driving new uses so that current uses increase their use of PCs and drive new users to buy PCs. And there are a number of strategies there. For example, um, <coughs> Okay, there are, a number, there are a number of ways of doing so. For example, Intel decides to start a new division. It's called the ProShare division. And the idea Intel has, this is back in 1994, uh, is to do PC video conferencing. Um, PC video conferencing. 1994 video conferencing can only be done with big conferencing room. There was a company called Picturedell. They sold the complete equipment for a complete room. You would buy one room in Boston, one room in San Francisco, and you would do video conferencing. Nobody even thought about doing PC video conferencing. So Intel actually starts by uh, investing money in companies who develop uh, video codecs, so videos can run on PCs, and it actually built itself the whole solution with the camera and the boards. So actually, if you want to do video conferencing, you buy a set, it has two boards, 
One board goes to one PC in Boston, the other board goes to the PC in San Francisco, and people can talk with Intel. Intel also goes into the modem market. I don't think you guys remember, but uh, back in those days, do you remember this sound? Back then, if you wanted to connect to the internet, you had to buy a modem. Modems were very expensive. It was about $150 card, the same card that I showed you here, to, buy, to put into a PC. Intel said, I need to get more uses to the PCs. So I want more users to buy modems so they can connect to the internet and they will have more uses. If they have more uses, they'll buy more PCs because it uses more of the PCs in the home. Okay? So Intel actually entered the modem market. They created, started selling modems at about half the price of the market leader back then, US Robotics and Hayes were the market leaders. So they were selling $150. Intel was selling it $80. And actually, Intel didn't care about, so the basis almost sold in cost. Because they didn't care. They wanted to sell more CPUs. The only reason they entered the, they entered the modem market <coughs> was to increase sales of modems so people might <coughs> buy more PCs. So they didn't care to sell it at cost or just a little bit about cost. So Intel really had a very clear strategy about this. Intel enter any market that drives new uses or users for the PC market. So they entered the modem market, video conferencing, they also entered the networking market, connecting to networks, internet market, okay? Intel will exit one of these markets when it cannot achieve dominant market position, okay? So uh, there was a while that Intel actually decided to leave the networking market because a company called 3Com was actually the market leader. Intel could, Intel, could, Intel could not get the dominant market position, so they backed out. They came back again later. Or the market no longer requires Intel's presence to develop. So basically, Intel had a modem division for about four years, three years, until they crushed this market and uh, brought the prices to $50, and then they pulled out of the market and closed the division. Because the market was $50, the price was down, what do they care anymore? Okay? Um, so, and also, I don't know, that's something people, most people don't know, but there was actually a, po a part in time, a, a period in time, 93 to 97, Intel was the world's largest motherboard manufacturer. Most of the PCs you bought back then, if it was a PC from Acer or from Packard Bell or from other small vendors, actually Intel sold them this, the, the motherboard at cost plus uh, uh, market. Why? They wanted to sell more CPUs. Okay? Once again, corner in every possible market. Intel invested so much in this, uh, you know, this whole concept of video conferencing was very new. So they actually went out with a TV show called uh, uh, Advertorial. So it's educational uh, uh, advertisement. Okay? I don't know if you can see it here. Uh, maybe it will work, maybe it will not. Never mind, but there's a whole movie here. It's about 15 minutes. So it's not just an ad, it's a 15 minutes movie. Explain to people why video conferencing is important and that they should buy Intel ProShare to do video conferencing. Okay, so tremendous effort in that market. So that was another strategy. You know, once we got the pie, now let's increase the pie, okay? In the same strategy of increasing the pie, Intel started Intel Ventures. Intel Ventures, I forget exactly which year they started, I think it was 91. Let me see if I have it here. I don't, okay, I think it was 89 or 91. Intel started what is called Intel Capital. 
Okay? Ah, 91. Okay. Inter Intercapital was set up in 1991. One of the key objectives is to enable new technologies to drive new users for VCs. The idea was we want to work with, especially with either application providers or hardware providers that produce applications that require a lot of CPU power. Why? Because if you try to run this a lot of CPU power in 486, it runs very slow. If it runs very slow, you buy a Pentium. You run it on the Pentium, and it's very, very power consumption. It starts to run very slow. You run it on the next generation of Pentium. And this is how you move from one generation to the other. Now, look at this statement. So to, when, when Intel set up Intel Capital, there was a document that described Intel Capital strategy. Okay? Point number three in that, in that document was this. A venture capital investor that says, return on investment is not an objective. It was actually written in the document. We are going to do venture capital investments, but we don't care about return on investment. Cash-wise. Why? We want to sell more CPUs. So if we invest in a company that produces video conferencing, for example, okay, we invest in them because we want them to uh, be successful in the market. If they be successful in the market, people will buy, will buy more PCs, meaning they'll buy more CPUs. Okay? This is just shows you the way of thinking of Intel. It's all around one thing. How do I get to full production of CPUs? How do I get to produce at full capacity low price so I can get lower price and I can continuously conquer the market and keep my 80% market share? So if I summarize this, when I put it all together, as I told you, when I wrote this, I was really shocked. I didn't realize this is what we did back then. But we're doing everything, starting with the mandate that we need to be the market leader. That means we need to produce at full capacity. This means we need to create demand. And we're going to deconstruct the industry. We're going to brand what we're doing. We're going to go after the business market. We're going to go after the home market. We're going to go after the software uh, uh, market. We're going to push our OEMs to move faster and faster and faster into new products. We're going to enable new uh, uh, users and new users. And we're going to move faster the competition so they can't catch us. And by this circle, by actually touching every facet of the market, Intel is still today the market leader. Today, the, market, the, the competition is not that hard that it was because most of the competitors died. Intel basically killed them on this road. Okay? Cyrex doesn't exist. AMD at 20%. Uh, the digital equipment company doesn't exist. Uh, PowerPC doesn't exist. Uh, National Semiconductor is not in this market anymore. None of these competitors are there anymore. Okay? So the main point I was trying to make <coughs> as we started is that we didn't, we didn't make a strategy as a, you know, as a one vector. We're going to be the CPU provider, so let's compete with CPUs and CPU manufacturers. No, we're going to take a holistic view of all the market and going to corner every piece of that market, making sure that it's always us, the selected party. So tell me, yeah, that's great, but uh, how is this relevant for today? I mean, anyone else is doing something like that today? What do you think? Apple. In what way? I don't know, Apple, when he takes new icons out, he, the old Apple works slower, and the, some applications don't work, and you have to download, and then it's a jack. I mean, Apple is constantly taking new products out to make the old ones just obsolete. Actually, it's very close. The way Apple does that today is by Apple Store. They create demand. Okay, Apple Store. Apple takes 30% of every sale in Apple Store, and they basically do almost nothing. If you look at the Apple Store, it's a cash machine. Okay, and this is where Apple makes a tremendous amount of their net profit. It is from the Apple Store. Okay, but this is also a way for them to dominate their, their section. Other examples? Anyone? Let me give you an obvious one. Have you heard of this company? Yes. Tesla. So, okay, how is Tesla going to take over the market? Well, they did a very interesting move. Tesla started to equip parking lots in the US 
with the Tesla uh, electric charger device. So this is an electric charging device by Tesla. And basically, so this is great. So if I buy a Tesla car, almost everywhere in the US, I mean, what is the main concern of an electric car owner? Range. Range, battery, great. So almost every parking lot or many parking lots in the US, you now have the Tesla uh, um, supercharger. Uh -huh. But it is something more. They went to car manufacturers and told them, look, why don't you buy our chassis? If you buy our chassis, first of all, you'll be, you'll be very quick to market because on this chassis you can put your car. So you know, we talked about the, the Mercedes-Benz A180. You can take the same structure, put it on this chassis, and you can go to market very quickly. Not only that, but if you have our chassis, your car can charge everywhere in the US. The same way of thinking in a different industry. OK, you follow me on that? Yes. OK? So they're not the only one. There are other tactics by small companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and so forth. Um, so if you look at what they've done, and you think about the strategies, and start kind of breaking this down into small pieces, I'm sure that each and every one of you can think of your industry and what you're doing there today, and how you can find ways, based on these strategies, to develop and increase your market position just on this way of thinking. Okay? That's it for me for today. Thank you so much. And questions, of course. <laughs> yes. How much money did you invest in venture capital companies to 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 make to, to create a market for your uh, CPUs? I mean, to, to grow it. How I don't much know. money? Maybe in regards of sales or regards of EBITDA or whatever. I don't remember how much money was in the fund, but and I don't know if it was even at least the beginning. I'm not sure it was actually managed as the fund. I think it was just taking out of uh, free cash, okay? So just out of, uh, out of uh, company cash, and no one actually looked as a, as a farm. Um, I can tell you that back then, Intel had so, had so much cash. Just to quote uh, one of the key executives uh, in the company, Frank Gill. Frank Gill, you know, in one conversation, he tells me, Gale, we're not rich, we're filthy rich. I mean, Intel had billions of dollars in cash. Back uh, like in those days, not too Yes. How does Intel sit today with uh, the marketplace the way it is and the Asian makers and the Internet of Things? What is their strategy moving forward? Because it seems like I've seen the i3 and the 5 and the 7 have been around for a long time. I haven't seen a whole lot of driving changes in terms of the name of the chip. So it, what's their strategy today? So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not part of Intel anymore, but I can tell you what I'm, what I'm observing. First of all, competition is dead. To create a CPU, it's a major effort and a huge investment, investment much more than it was back then, especially because the dimensions of the of the, uh, of the, small. Of the uh, wires, if you like, in the CPU becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, and the factories are becoming more like you know 20, 25 billion dollars to create a factory. Who has the kind of cash? Only Intel. So you know it's very hard to compete if at all. Uh, so if you're talking about the fact that CPUs are not coming out as fast as they used to. You're absolutely right. It's, they don't come as fast as they used to because the competition is not there. There's no driver to do that. Uh, I think Intel just announced a new generation. I forget the name of it, but I heard something that they announced. But there isn't an Asian manufacturer who has decided to try and do something about it. I mean, a Chinese guy who, you know, they, there's a lot of money over there. That Intel is so advanced that uh, equipment manufacturers manufacture specific equipment just for Intel because they're so ahead of the market. Okay, this is why the equipment is so expensive because it's like it's not one of the kind because they full of this they produce a full factory, but it's a one factory of a kind. Uh, it's very hard to compete on the manufacturing side. So it's AMD and Intel. Those are those two. Yes. Are yes. AMD and Intel basically was that. Yeah. Please. Uh, there was a question made uh, when we were on the break. Uh, did Intel do something with uh, cell phones, smartphones? Do you know? Because uh, yes. that's, that's yes. something that can drive them out of the market if you, you don't go into smartphones. So Intel looked at the smartphone market, smart market with great concern that it's exactly what's going to happen, that the cell phone market is going to dominate. And I think sometimes in the early, two, I think 2006, 2007, 
They acquired a company called DSPG that manufactured uh, uh, the core of uh, uh, cell phone uh, CPUs based on something that's called ARM technology. Uh, actually, all, all of the CPUs today, not all, but I guess the vast majority, uh, all the uh, cell phones, the CPU in them is manufactured by a company called ARM, ARM, the British company. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Intel was trying to compete with that. They failed miserably, uh, so they pulled out of the market. As I said, they could not uh, reach a dominant position, so they pulled out, went back to the PC. Uh, I also read an article recently that actually the PC market is reviving. Apparently, people are going back to laptops after they tried a lot to work with uh, the small devices, they went back to laptops, so maybe Intel is up on the app, so maybe it's a good time to buy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they had a try, but they didn't make it. Other questions, question? please. So I wanna, I'll show you one, uh, uh, actually since, since you've asked about how fast things are moving, I'll show you something which was very funny. I think I have it here. Yes. So, I don't know if you know, Gooseberry, Gooseberry is a caricature uh, painter in the US. And this was a caricature that was uh, uh, published in the uh, middle of 1994. And someone taking upon the fact that CPUs were coming out at such a quick pace that consumers could not keep pace with that. So the first session said, oh, you have a new toy. And the boy says, uh, no, 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 it's a new tool. Uh, a tool, uh, a tool to, take, to take me into the 21st cent century. Um, I've, been I've been waiting for the new generation of microprocessors this computer is so leading edge, it makes my teeth hurt. Uh, it's about 10 times as fast as the last PC we got. It has unbelievable capabilities. I'm just beginning to explore. And then the lady goes, oh, what's that? What's this? It says, best it used before July 1994. <laughs> That's all true. Because PCs were coming out so quickly, yeah, we went. you know, every six months they had to buy a new one. Okay. Anyway, any more questions, guys? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>
literature, finance, uh, uh, medicine, law, philosophy, psychology, everyone. So we did the program of uh, 60 credits that we're going to teach everyone entrepreneurship. Now, why do I think this is important? Why do I think everyone should speak the entrepreneurship language? Because, you know, if, if you look at that today, what's happening in many of the companies, uh, our employees, when they see a problem or an opportunity, most times, they're not going to say anything about it. For a few reasons. First of all, they uh, may think, well, maybe I don't understand what I'm seeing. Maybe, well, probably someone already seen this problem and think, thought it should be that way. <coughs> or maybe they're just afraid, you know? If I point out the problem, people are going to be upset with me. If I point out the problem, maybe I'll get laughed at because I don't understand what I'm doing. Or maybe I'll be asked to fix it, and I don't know how to fix it. So we need to break this mold. We need to really empower the police to come up and say, hey, I have a new idea. I have a new opportunity. When I think about teaching entrepreneurship, I don't think about creating the next Bill Gates or uh, Jeff Bezos. Entrepreneurial mindset is really a mindset. It's a mindset that the basic for it is discontent with the current situation. And it's the courage, this employees and courage to come and say, this could be better, okay? Now, if you look at the startup world, what do I mean by this could be better? This could be better means that if I want to uh, 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 drive from point A to point B, there's got to be a better way than just flipping through maps and you know, invent, invent ways. Uh, this could be better means if I want to search the internet, there's got to be a better way and I invent Google. So we need to empower our employees so they have the courage to say, hey, if there is a problem here or there is an opportunity. And the way to do so, I believe, mm -hmm. is to teach them the tools of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You may think that you know, entrepreneurship you can't really teach someone to be an entrepreneur. You know, it's, it's in the genes, no? I mean, if you look at Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and so forth, they never studied entrepreneurship, okay? They actually have it, you know? They have this ability to see new things and to take market ahead. Um, but when I think about teaching entrepreneurship, I actually think about uh, 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 music schools. Any of you guys been to a music school? No. Yeah. Okay, but if you've been to music school, one of the things you learn in music school is a whole class of music composition, how to become a composer. But if you're studying music composition, this does not turn you into a world-renowned composer like Beethoven or Schubert or, or whomever. It gives you a language and a set of tools how to be successful in the world of music. In the same way, when I teach someone entrepreneurship, I don't expect them to invent the next big thing, but I want them to have a certain language, the language of entrepreneurship and the toolkit of entrepreneurship. This means the ability to identify the ideas, the ability to do some kind of analysis of the ideas, the ability to put a business plan around these ideas. And this is why I believe that we need to teach entrepreneurship to everyone, and why I'm trying to get to all our students. Because if I give them these tools, when they get to the workplace, it doesn't matter if they work for uh, a public transportation company, a textile company, a hardware company, or a social <coughs> company. They have the tools to look around them, identify opportunities, and even if they don't know what to do about it, at least they know the plan, and maybe they'll talk to one of their colleagues, say, I'm seeing something here, what do you say? What can we do about this? So they can have it for everyone else. So this is kind of what we're doing in Tel Aviv University. And next year, uh, we have this program of 16 uh, units, 16 credits, academic credits, and each and every student at Delaware University next year will be able to study entrepreneurship as part of their degree. So if you're studying philosophy and your degree is three years, 120 points, you'll be able to have 104 points philosophy and 16 points entrepreneurship. The same with literature, with medicine, with law, with uh, history, anything. So hope this is helpful with it and also answered your uh, question there. Thank you.